I took a trip recently and it was so great that I want to tell you about it and also take you there. I have to admit, since I have done a number of psychedelic trips, now even when I'm fully sober, a lot of things I do feel like trips. A simple walk around my neighborhood feels like that. If I top it with an interesting talk, podcast or music and my own contemplation, this is often like one of the most meaningful experiences yet. I humbly observe the likes of Leo Gura, Frank Young and others who claim to have reached higher and higher levels of enlightenment. If they're happy, I'm really happy for them. But while I'm aware that there is a lot of crazy, unbelievable experiences possible, I also believe there is a point of enough in terms of consciousness development. Same as there are points of enough in money, career, romantic relationships and any other aspect of life you find value in. I am not saying that extra billion dollars is not worth anything to Bill Gates. I'm not saying that another girlfriend is not worth anything to Leonardo DiCaprio. I'm not saying that another feeling of oneness with the universe is not beautiful. I'm only saying that beyond a certain point, the gains will not bring a lot of value anymore. And I see a lot of people stuck in denial. They are in their safe environment where they were successful and they are scared to move beyond. So to cover it up, they pretend that another million bucks, another girl or another 10 kilograms in a squat will define them and prove they are the men. If you believe, you believe. I don't. I feel like my life is a game made of many levels. One level is school. Yeah, my grades are points. I graduated. Not really into becoming a tenured professor, so I can move to another level where the points I can score are somewhere else. For example, romantic relationships. Find love. Realize it's an illusion. Create a long-lasting relationship nonetheless. Have kids. Become a grandparent. Or your career. Get a job. Get a pay raise. Become a manager. Create your own business. Own 50 businesses. Is it enough or will the 51st one still make you much happier? If you never stop, you will not have the opportunity to score at another level. And let me assure you, there are many levels and many different kinds of points. The key skill in life is to know when and what's enough. Perhaps we could call it wisdom. Or to keep up appearances when I will be sharing my methods to know what's enough, we can also call it my delusions. My main inspiration to create this video were two people, 19-year-old Jackie Liu and 81-year-old Howard Stevenson. Together, they're 100. 19 plus 81 equals 100. They both share their life lessons very humbly, very wisely, and each with their unique perspective. So walking and listening to them felt like a trip. I felt like I've been part of their process witnessing it and sharing their joys and struggles. I experienced tears, laughter and very freeing peace of mind. My passport says I'm closer to Jackie, but I kind of feel closer to Howard. So let me start by quoting him because he touches on the most important factor influencing how fully you can live your life, how you can experience more of the levels and score more of the points. And the most important factor influencing your attitude to life is your attitude to death. You don't know when it's going to end. Um, I died three years ago, literally. I flatlined. I happened to do it walking across campus at Harvard Business School on a sunny day in January, and it was really good. They came up and somebody gave me CPR, and 90 seconds later they came out with a defibrillator, and 45 minutes later they got me stable enough to get me to the hospital. And then you got to think, eh, what's life been like? And the nice thing is when I wake into the hospital, you know, my wife is standing there and I've been out for three days and she said, do you know where you are? And I looked around and said, yes, I'm in a hospital. And she said, do you know why you're here? And I said, I presume something serious happened. <laughs> uh, and she told me, I said, you know, my first thought is it's nice to be here. Uh, and the second was, well, what if it had been the end? And the answer was, well, it was a good life. You know, I really had no regrets. Uh, you know, I had some more things I wanted to do, but, you know, I was walking across campus with a friend, so it was pretty good. 
you know, if that's the way you have to go, and I wouldn't have had to clean out my office that way. So that was really good. Life goals. Attitude to mortality full of acceptance. That's what matters. People, impermanence, lack of attachments. Once you can deal with the fear of death, you are more likely to find courage to live. Now let's give the voice to the young one. It's wishful thinking to believe that you can forever be a child. I don't mean no disrespect, but bitch, watch me. That you can forever cling on to simplicity, to black and white and hard edges. That's exactly what I'm trying to accomplish here. Answering the question, what's enough, I believe is really simple. Let me take you there. Obviously, the most correct answer is, I don't know, and you'll never know. And accepting that there can be no objective, absolute, verifiable answer is the game changer. Because then you can stop trying hard to reach something that does not even exist. However, there is a subjective answer. What is your opinion? What is your belief? What is your prediction? We acknowledged that we don't know if bench pressing only 100 kilograms will be enough for me, or perhaps extra 10 kilograms will taste really sweet. We would have to travel in time to find out, but we can speculate. Is the effort to train even harder worth it? And what do I have to sacrifice? You see, I quit my job when I was earning 20,000 in some currency. I also had some money saved. Some people called it bravery or being insane. That I'm brave enough to give up 20,000 to focus on my personal and spiritual development. I guess I wouldn't be that brave if I was earning 40,000. And after six months, my bravery would cost even more because 40,000 wouldn't be enough. And then there's a question of time because what's enough for today, what's enough for this week, what's enough for this year, and what's enough for a lifetime? So the value of enough is subjective, speculative, depending on what is to be sacrificed for it, and also time constraint. But it is. Same as the probability of Brazil winning the World Cup. We don't know what it is, but it is. And we make decisions based on our assumptions. Example that has actually been used in both Jackie's and Hobart's talk. Should you pursue your passion as a job? So there's a lot of bad advice out there. Uh, simple rules, follow your passion. Oh, wonderful. Uh, <laughs> I'm passionate about being an actor. Oh, okay. How many parents are supporting, have kids on deep subsidy trying to be an actor? Uh, or a writer in Hollywood or those kind of things. So, and they get to about 50 and they say, I'm not really going to make it. Now what am I going to do? And uh, by the way, that's about when the parents die, so the subsidy stops. And it's really a problem. Another reason I hesitate to pursue art, which is more pragmatic, is that I worry about burnout. And that's not to mention the money part. How the fuck do you make money? So yeah, I don't know. I'll probably change my mind in like a week. And change my mind, I did. Y'all, I think I want to be an artist. Why, Why use brain? brain when you can not use brain? The unknown is scary. I'm diving into that bitch. Choosing art feels like a tangible step in the direction of self-compassion and maybe healing. Once you've accepted that your whole life is a series of inevitable risks, you're good. You cannot predict what will happen. Your job is merely to calculate risk and go with your best informed decision. And enjoy the process. I estimate way over 90% probability that Jackie would be successful as an artist and that I wouldn't be. But if in 10 years she's broke and burnt out and I'm number one violinist in the world, well, it's unlikely but not impossible. So let's try our best and enjoy as it all unfolds. I'm okay with not being a popular YouTuber. I enjoy the process of thinking through ideas and interacting with people afterwards. What do I sacrifice to follow this passion? Not much. My life is in order and I'm willing to back away from this anytime as soon as the sacrifices would be too high. For example, I need more time to spend with my children, I need to go to work to earn more money, or if I find a new hobby. 
I believe the same approach can bring a lot of clarity even with such decisions as finding the right partner. Availability of an unlimited number of people through the internet clearly is a challenge for us. We've adapted to know maybe 150 people, and we know that subconsciously comparing ourselves on Instagram is challenging for our mental health. The biggest illusion to realize, in my humble opinion, is that our job is to find the most perfect partner in the world. Even when we are happy with someone, our mind may whisper to us, come on, maybe you can aim higher? If you follow this, you are guaranteed to never settle. So, instead of looking for someone who is perfectly pretty, kind and strong, I believe our job is to look for someone who is pretty enough, kind enough and strong enough. Why do you even want to be with someone? It's a perfectly valid question, and once you can honestly answer it, it might be easier to know what's your enough. My wife and I, between us, have seven kids and 12 grandchildren. Uh, and we're both married to jerks, so one year I got to pay tuition at Columbia, <laughs> Yale, Harvard, Williams, and Bowdoin. Uh, I'm bragging and complaining. <laughs> but one of the most important pieces of advice I think I've given my kids is marry a happy person, because you're not going to change somebody who's unhappy into somebody who's happy. So figure out if they're happy or not. While Howard is famous for his definition of entrepreneurship, I love Jackie's definition of friendship. The relationship has to be cultivated and maintained, like actively watering a garden instead of just letting the rain fall. I think our society devalues friendships as subordinate to romantic relationships, as tiny electrons peripheral to the nucleus of romantic love. But if it's the right kind of friendship, the kind defined by radical acceptance and intimate trust and unconditional love and laughter that makes your ribs hurt. And for me especially, the radical intention of acceptance is the most important foundation for any deep relationship. I see an analogy between friendship and romance and meaning and happiness. We all want to be happy and loved, but by focusing on happiness and love instead of friendship and meaning, we decrease our chances to succeed in love and happiness. Meaningful life is the greatest foundation for happiness. And friendship is the greatest foundation for love. Before you see a lover in another human being, try seeing a human being and a friend in them in the first place. But hey, these are just my opinions or delusions. Unfortunately, I don't think I've ever not been a tryhard. In 10th grade, my English teacher was concerned about me, so he was like, Jackie, what do you do for fun? What do you do in your free time? I was like, oh, come again? Fun? Definition, please? Language of origin? Use it in a sentence? I spoke to my dad recently. He's been retired for 10 years. I have been retired for six years. And you know what? We've both worked harder since retirement. I'm busy every day, but I'm at peace with that. I have always had tendencies to work as much as possible, exhaust myself, burn out, recharge, and continue the cycle. It's like I'm addicted to work. Rehab is difficult. Forcing myself to rest has always been the hardest part of the job. The shift in perspective that has helped me was realizing I'm always working. My body is always working. Resting is part of the job. It's all about management. If I accept that I'm bound to work 24 hours a day and all I have to do is juggle with tasks, that's somehow resonated with me. Sleep is work. Sex is work, eating chocolate is work, recording a YouTube video is work. I don't get money for any of it, but I do get something. If I didn't, I wouldn't be doing it. It's about juggling. Now, you know, juggling is really uh, an art. If you think about juggling, you got to keep your eye on all the balls. You know, if you only look at one ball, you're going to drop the others. So you got to keep your eye on all the balls. When you touch something, you have to give it energy. You know, nobody applauds you as a juggler if you hold all the balls in your hand. You can balance the balls, but that's not a very interesting thing. In, in juggling, you catch it and you throw it almost immediately. But you have to give it energy, you have to give it direction, and you have to get rid of it. And you have to calculate. If those of you who, I just love to go to Cirque du Soleil. You see them throwing these things 
and they catch them over there, how they get them to come down at the right time over there is absolutely beyond me. But I think what it amounts to is really practice, which is why when you think of those spirals, these people that we admire often have been practicing the skill of juggling all of their life. I've been working on this video for approximately 20 hours. It was easy and smooth because I was managing my to-do list and also my expectations. I'll be grateful if I see some comments or any other form of interaction. And I know what to do next if there will be none of it. I had it on my list as a part of my morning routine, perhaps you could call it. Before other things on my list, gym, other duties, time and attention for my relationships, and also rest, because I am not scared of difficult tasks. Acceptance is the key, and I think that's enough for now. I'm grateful to Jackie, Howard, and to you, a beautiful human being.